Robert Talese, it's good to see you. Well, thank you for having me, Dan. Uh, welcome to everyone in the uh, Sophia audience, the larger Meaning of Life TV, Bloggingheads.tv audience. Uh, this is the Sophia program. I'm Daniel Kaufman, uh, the host. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. I publish and edit the Electric Agora, an online magazine, and I am very happy today to be joined uh, by Robert Talese, a professor at Vanderbilt University and author of this book, Overdoing Democracy, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and I really highly recommend to people, um, and I think you'll see why by the time we're done. Um, it turns out, and this is a strange sort of coincidence, is that this book was recommended to me by several people uh, who I talked to on Twitter. And so then I started, you know, I, I wound up talking to Robert on Twitter, and it turns out we were at the CUNY Graduate Center roughly at the same time. <laughs> and maybe it's just because I was drinking so much that I don't rem- I, I, I don't know – Maybe we weren't in the same like peer group. I don't remember, but I don't remember us ever really hanging out. Or I don't think so. You know, <laughs> I mean, in all fairness, um, you know, in the years that we were both at CUNY, um, it wasn't exactly. I mean, it had all kinds of virtues. One of the virtues it didn't have, uh, in fact, one of the vices it had is really hard uh, to, um, there wasn't much community, let's put it that way, because yeah. of the, the way the space was set up and the graduate departments were moving from, you know, a building on uh, 42nd to 43rd and then ultimately to 34th Street. And so yeah. Um, yeah. there was a lot of transition going on. So I'm sure we just, we were probably in the same rooms a couple of times, but uh, yeah, I was out before they moved, and um, and I also do remember that the the student the student social groups were pretty cliquish, and so you could be in one group and not really see the people in the others, other than in classes and stuff. Yeah, I think I was right. mostly in philosophy of language and metaphysics and stuff like that, and so we may we may not have even taken too many of the same classes, but that's um, probably true. Um, so. Robert, we're going to talk about this book, um, and um, it's getting a lot of attention. It's 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 definitely broken out beyond the academic, hasn't it? Yeah, sure. You're getting a lot of inv- people wanting to talk to you about this, um, and I think that that's a great thing. One thing about it is it is accessible. I mean, it's very rigorous, but but you can pick this up and read this if you have no academic really background at all, um, and um, so it's it's a very very accessible book. I'm pleased. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear you say that. I, yeah, I worked hard yeah. at the writing. <laughs> the writing's excellent, and and like I said, to to balance rigor and accessibility is not easy at all. Um, Robert, why don't you introduce us um, a little bit to the to the main thesis? If you want to talk a little bit about what motivated it, that would be the, the book. That would be interesting. It, does it primarily come out of your academic work? Does it come out of concern about the current political situation? And maybe also you could, um, you know, start, start to introduce some of the the main theses. Sure. So you know, I my my full time sort of academic occupation, as it were, uh, is in political philosophy and in particular in democratic theory. Um, and so. Um, my entire career, or at least most of my research life, um, has been uh, devoted to writing and thinking and um, uh, arguing about uh, democracy and in particular um, about the epistemic um, uh, dimension of democratic legitimacy, the epistemic potentiality for um, democratic processes to produce good results or more justified um, um, political commitments among citizens. This book um, is a bit of a departure. And in fact, uh, I think the first sentence of the book is the irony is not lost on me uh, because I think this is the, uh, this might be the fourth book I've written with democracy in the title. uh, And the thesis of this book is that we need to do something else. (laughs) So, um, you know, uh, it took me four books to get to the, the idea that um, uh, there are other things we're thinking about. So um. So are you going to stop talking about politics <laughs> after this book? Are you going to turn to like aesthetics or philosophy of mind or something? You know, it's, um, it's crossed my mind that it might be good for me uh, in all kinds of respects to do that. Uh, but I suspect, I suspect not. Um, so, you know, maybe at the end of the day, I'm a hypocrite, but um, so the book, um, the book emerged out of sort of the two things that occurred to me um, uh, at roughly the same time. 
one of which was a uh, an academic thought uh, or a thought that emerged out of my academic research. The second was a um, uh, something that emerged out of a conversation I had with so- with somebody who's not an academic at all. So let me just start with the academic, the more boring one. You know, it struck me um, that you can read a lot of democratic theory, and in fact, a lot of political philosophy uh, more broadly, and come across the, either the idea or at least get the sense that um, there's a pretty wide consensus uh, on the thought that um, more democracy is always better. That because democracy is such a crucial and important social good, that because democracy is the sort of necessary precondition for other kinds of political goods, and maybe because in the absence of democracy, politics and all kinds of other registers goes terribly wrong, um, the, the thought is often that from these sort of observations, it's entailed that democracy more democracy is always better that um what's meant by more democracy well that um more participation okay. more engagement more politically uh, astute thinking more time and effort and energy put into uh, on the on behalf of citizens put into politics and so um the idea is that it's such an important good that there could never be too much of it or it could never be um uh, can never loom too large in the in our social lives, and in fact, you know, some uh, some people who are tuning in probably, you know, are aware of these thoughts. You know, there's the a famous dictum that's attributed both to Jane Adams and to John Dewey. Um, you know, the, you know, the cure for democracy's ills is always more democracy. Um, uh, similar thoughts also, you, you, and by the way, you can see, you can read that kind of thought in Rousseau. You could read that kind of thought in a lot of, um, participationists, a lot of deliberativists. Um, you know, here's another, uh, sort of way to, um, uh, capture, uh, uh, the, the general trend. You know, um, among deliberative Democrats, and I think it's still fair to say that, um, you know, among deliberative, uh, among democratic theorists, some version or other of the deliberative idea that what accounts for the legitimacy of democratic outcomes is that citizens have had the opportunity and maybe more than merely the opportunity, but have, uh, had, uh, have been abled, have been enabled to, um, talk through and think through and trade reasons and the rest. And that's somehow connected on most deliberative issues to the legitimacy or the bindingness of the outcomes. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very easy to find in this massive literature on democratic theory, most of which has uh, at least some deliberative element. Um, in fact, most of it is kind of overtly deliberativist. It's very easy to find in that literature, lots of discussions of, the ways in which certain settings and forums and venues are bad for deliberation. Um, and a lot of uh, theorists give their time to thinking about how to construct and how to um, prepare venues and settings for good deliberation. Um, it's very, very rare that you find anybody in democratic theory identifying a venue or a site where deliberation could be engaged properly, but nonetheless ought not be, <laughs> right? Very, very hard to find that, like, yeah, you could talk politics, you could trade your political views here, you could talk about your reasons for your political advocacy in this setting, and it would go pretty well, but nonetheless, there are other kinds of considerations that suggest you ought not do that there. Um, okay, so that's the sort of academic side of the, the motivation. I started wondering, like, you know, it's just not the case that... Um, uh, with respect to other things that we have reason to think are more than merely instrumentally good, right? You know, I'm not, I'm not yet saying democracy is intrinsically good. It just looks to me like it's more than merely instrumentally good. Um, it looks to me like, yeah, there are all kinds of things that are good in some non-instrumental way where it just doesn't follow that more is always better or that it ought to be as central to our lives as we can make it. So right. that, was the, and that was the sort of philosophical thought that there seemed to be a kind of error uh, or a, this sort of an inference that didn't quite sit well with me, but it seemed to be running through a lot of contemporary democratic theory. Now, the the, the second um, uh, thing that you know episode that got me thinking about about this, which was actually the um, 
uh, the thing that happened that is, I think, you know, more causally responsible for me actually writing the book, um, uh, you know, after the election of our current president, uh, I actually had, you know, tell the story in the book. I had lunch with somebody who was just scared to death of Thanksgiving. Um, because, you know, people, people were gathering and, you know, the person had reason to think that they were not politically allied. And, uh, you know, the, the person hadn't seen her in a while. It was just worries like, yeah, people are coming over and it's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be awful. And I'm going to go through all this work. And I'm going to make all this food and people are going to storm out and it's going to be nasty and tense and all the rest. And so, you know, she had, uh, alerted me to the fact, uh, and, um, you know, I hadn't believed, I didn't believe her the first she told me. She alerted me to the fact that there is a, um, uh, a, a pretty robust, uh, journalistic genre, um, even at the time, and it's since become even more robust. In November, end of October, November, journalists writing columns about how to survive this ordeal of Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I actually recall there was one journalist, a progressive journalist, who was who wrote an op-ed saying you ought to fuck up your family's Thanksgiving. I mean, he had a lengthy. I'm going to try and find a link to it. I don't know if you can remember it, that. There will be a link section attached to it. Yeah. But I find it absolutely incredible. It was. It was. It was just this incredibly self-important, self-righteous sort of just like, you know, these issues are so important. No moment should go past, should pass in which they're not addressed. You know I mean? It was, this is exactly right. And so, yeah, so you get, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a gamut, right? So yeah, you get the, the, you know, um, you're, you're complicit with your drunk uncle's racist views. If you don't, you know, Boy, Thanksgiving, right? Yeah, right. If you don't, if you don't throw something at him, um, and then, you know, there are the more subtle things, which are, you know, um, there are, there are certain kinds of strategies you can employ to deescalate, to change the topic, to pivot. Right. But, right. you know, let's face it, that's not always going to work. And if you think it's not going to work, stay home. That's another <laughs> position, you know, just can you know, cancel the holiday. Um, <laughs> and then there are, you know, these, um, you know, pretty milk toasty, but that's not to say non, not sensible, you know, the, okay, you know, just try to, you know, try to listen, try to be calm. Don't, don't get, don't get sucked in, um, you know, emphasize common ground. You know, these are just sort of good, you know, uh, um, uh, interpersonal habits <laughs> in general. And maybe we need reminders about what good interpersonal habits are when we're around our family. But um, so, <laughs> so you know, she, she was telling me like she had read an article and it was saying pretty sensible things. And it just struck me. I just said, you know, couldn't you just send out to all of the people, don't pick out particulars and don't, just, just a full on, like whoever's coming, just send an email so that they see everyone, everyone sees that everyone else is getting it with just a message saying, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to, I'm, I'm really looking forward to in, uh, reconnecting with, with everyone and it's going to be a very nice time and we'll, we'll have a great time. Um, but, you know, let's not forget that we're, we're gathering to reconnect to, you know, catch up after a year where we've all been doing our own thing and spinning off in other direct in different directions. And, you know, maybe just say politics isn't what we're here for. We're here for, you know, reconnecting right. on some other basis. Right. And she looked at me, she said, Oh, no, that'll never work. <laughs> and so good. Right. So th th that was, you know, part of my reaction was really. And then I thought, well, yeah, of course that would never work. Yeah. That would only exacerbate things. That would only lead people to think that they were being targeted and singled out, even though that everybody like, who's really, what you're telling me, I can't say what I want to say. You know, I mean, so you can imagine how certain families work, maybe many families work. And so she said, oh, no, no, that would never work. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah. And then, but you know, later on, a couple of days later, I started looking at this genre and sort of reading all of these advice columns. It's a very peculiar sort of dynamic here that um, this is a this is a pretty you know uh, uh, well populated genre, and you know so it must be that you know, a couple of million Americans yeah a couple million Americans are looking to the advice of a stranger for dealing with their family for the sake of enjoying a holiday that's mostly about eating. So, you know, like, how, how can we mess that up? Um, so, yeah, I started thinking, like, wow, this is very peculiar. And then it struck me. I'm like, whoa, like, that, you know, that there couldn't be a context 
where or that it seems to us that there could not be a context in which politics is out of place, despite the fact that the setting is right for discussions and engagement of politics. Right. So I think that's interesting. And then it sort of struck me that connection with this uh, up until that point, pretty, um, um, you know, distant uh, academic observation yeah. that yeah. people think more is always better because it's so, so, because democracy is such a crucial good. There could never, you know, we always yeah. want to try to get more of it. So those are the two sort of motivations, the sort of philosophical one. And then this, this real, like, I, you know, like, yeah, people sitting around dinner, we're screwing up, a, we're, screwing up a good meal because people, and again, I think it's important. The thesis of the book um, isn't that we ought to, you know, suppress our political differences or um, it's not a both sides kind of view that, you know, admit that your political enemies have always got something right, or you've always got something important or, you know, it's none of that. It's like, you know, the, the reaching across the aisle model of doing democracy uh, uh, when it's particularly contentious, uh, it's not that I resist that. I mean, that's what you got to do if you want to get political things done. But uh, the thesis of the book is that, you know, we need to reflect a little bit on the fact that politics has now become so central to nearly everything we do. And it's become our, our partisan affiliations and identifications have become so central to how we understand our own social identities that um, there seems to be no escape from it. Yeah. And the thesis of the book is uh, perhaps in, in the non-formal sense of paradox, su- surprisingly, <laughs> you know, that um, when politics is allowed to you know, be so central to our sense of ourselves. And when politics is an inescapable dimension of all of the things that we do together and in the presence uh, uh, of others, we actually get worse at it. Yeah. And so, um, so the thought is not even that, you know, don't sweat politics because it's, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Politics is small stuff. That's not the argument. It's this argument. That, no, the reason why you need to put politics in its place is because it's so important. And if you don't keep it in its right perspective, you get really, really bad at it and wind up doing less well, even for all the political objectives <laughs> on whose behalf you want to fight. So, um, there's almost like a, uh, for the philosophers, you know, there's almost like a one thought too many kind of problem that that, dem- that democratic citizens face. Like if you're constantly doing, if you're constantly seeing what you're doing as a contribution to engage democratic citizenship, you actually wind up messing the whole thing up, right? You actually wind up doing less less well at being a good Democrat. Yeah. So how's that for just? It's, a, one of, it's one of these things. Uh, you know, it's one of the few things that you actually don't necessarily get better at with more practice. Right. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> um, um, and, um, I, I, it's, it's funny that you, that you say that your, your, your explanation of where the ideas come from is really interesting to me because I myself have noticed since Trump, but I mean, even longer than that, um, that it seems more and more that people, um, are, you know, that, that people are placing the politics above, other things in their lives. I've, I just found it incomprehensible that someone would stop being friends with somebody or that's that who had with whom they had a friendship for years, or that someone would cease talking to a family member with whom otherwise they have no, you know, difficulties um, for political reasons. And, and I also was sort of wondering what on earth is going on. Um, and it seemed to me that part of the problem is, is that, the reasons are so many in interacting that it's hard to give a diagnostic. You know, one of the things about this is that you really do go to great lengths to sort of try to chase down all the different sources. But (laughs) even so, I think it's relatively a simplification, right. Of what's going on. Um, um, But I would like, but that's unavoidable. I mean, um, um, and so, and that's not by no means any sort of flaw. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, what you take as being the etiology of this problem, the, sure. so trace down some of the main lines. I mean, you talk about, you know, social, you talk about online life, social media, oversaturation. You talk about polarization. You talk about, um, um, to a certain extent, although I thought that maybe this is something that I would say I think has a greater role and maybe that I don't, you don't, you didn't talk about as much as I thought you could. 
the diminishing of people's relationships and people's um, uh, relationship networks, the yeah. sort of Robert putnam sort of problems, mm -hmm. the bowling alone sort of yeah. problems, the isolation, um, that may, maybe I'm thinking more that that plays a bigger role than some of the other things. But maybe you could at least talk about what you identify in the book as some of the main Sure. Sure. So Sources there, of this. Yeah, there, there are. So the, 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 just to bring the focus way back, um, the, the sort of the, the two pronged explanation uh, is sort of one we might think of as sort of a, a identifying a cognitive phenomenon that I call belief polarization. Some people might be familiar with the phenomenon because it's sometimes called group polarization. I think the group there is, is misleading given other things that are called polarization. You know, it's like when you, you the word polarization is constantly being used in the political vernacular among commentators and, and pundits or whatever. And it's almost never clear to me what exactly they talk, they're talking about when they use the word. So um, one is this cognitive phenomenon called belief polarization, which I'll talk about in a minute. It. The other is, you know, I think you're right to point out that, you know, it's the, 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 expl the explanatory account here is, is, is a kind of simplification. I'm just trying to capture a lot of stuff and fit it together. And um, let me just say, uh, you know, I, 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 it's, it's not comprehensive. It's not exhaustive because, as, as you rightly point out, you know, complex social phenomena are going to require lots of different explanatory, you know, you know, pivots and fulcrums and things. And it's just, you know, you got to write a book. <laughs> so um, it's actually uh, a virtue that you focus and don't just sort of shoot in a million directions. It's, it's, I'm, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah. So the, 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 the second sort of the second sort of horn of the explanatory uh, mechanism that's at work in the book. Uh, the first is this cognitive phenomenon. The second are these, you know, broadly speaking, these sort of sociological uh, uh, um, forces that I call collectively um, the saturation of the social by the political or just for short political saturation. Now, uh, just to sort of take one further step back and sort of set these two things up, um, you know, one thing that seems to me to have occurred to us as a society or have that, that has befallen us as a society over the past 30 years or so is, um, you know, this, um, you know, in, in, in some ways incredible and impressive uh, um, uh, extension of latitude over our lives, right? We have, you know, sort of a kind of latitude over the conditions, you know, over which we live, where we get information, who we interact with, you know, uh, talk in the book about, you know, how, you know, the idea of commuting to another state for your job, you know, was, you know, maybe to people uh, in highly urban areas with, you know, good transportation. But now it's sort of uh, uh, not an uncommon thing, uh, you know, that you can get uh, seafood in the middle of a desert. You know? So we've got um, this incredible technological power. And I know that a lot of accounts of the sort I'm telling tend to focus strictly on the Internet and on communications technology. And I don't want to downplay that. I don't want to say, yeah, that's got to be part of the story too. But I think even that, those features are part of a broader kind of technological expansion of the kind of control we exert over our social worlds. Um, we, and, don't have to, we don't have to accept givens and constraints. That's right. Good, we, life is at the individual level is tremendously customizable. That's good. I that's think that good. that's right. I think that, and I think that's actually a really important thread. Yeah, that's right. Right, right. So, so that we live in these um, increasingly personalized social worlds where um, the, the interactions we have, the kinds of uh, products we consume, the, the information we receive, the, um, the, the way in which we exchange uh, whatever it is that we're exchanging with others are all done on our terms and are customizable. And um, perhaps unsurprisingly, and this is not a, um, you know, not, this is not a, yet an objection to anything, perhaps unsurprisingly, you know, we've got that kind of latitude over the conditions under which we live, um, you know, unthinkable by our grandparents, for example, right? And most of us choose to make the social world in our own image. I mean, that's, you know, not, not a surprising upshot of this. And in fact, that's part of why we get such value out of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, shopping for groceries online. Yeah, I tell a story sometimes. I don't think this made it into the book. It couldn't have because I, I finished uh, the book before this happened. You know, 
as sometimes happens one day, you know, uh, you know, one, one day our microwave is working fine at home and the next day it doesn't work. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my wife and I are like, okay, we got to go get a microwave and, you know, we, we, you know, head on over to target. Um, turns out target doesn't have the one that they said that they would have. Right. And I'm standing in target, go on my phone and I order it. I order the model from Amazon. Right, like this is amazing. I'm shop, yeah. I'm shopping at another store in one store. Right, so you just, you know, you can imagine. So, like that would just be a kind of unthinkable thing. Not, I mean, even when uh, when you and I were kids, that would be an unthinkable thing, right? I was going to say this is very recent. This you don't have to go back to our grandparents. You got to go back to us. I mean, yeah. I mean, and and our social lives were not this customizable because we didn't spend so much of our social lives weren't lived so much online. That's and right. so, yeah, you might decide what click you want to be in but you couldn't avoid the other click right i mean they were there right um and were and would have an effect on you right you couldn't block them or filter them or so you sort of had to learn to endure that's right that's right right. you would have had to choose another microwave that's right right. yeah yeah yeah. and would have had to maybe make other choices on the basis of that and that's right you know so there would be all kinds so no we we wanted the we were able to online go find the one we wanted which again, it wasn't like we went to the store and just picked out one of the microwaves that happened to be there. Right. Found the thing. Target said, oh, yes, we have that. We went to the Target, like, oh, sorry, no, there was a mistake. And you bought it from their competitor in yeah. Target. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, good. <laughs> so that happened, you know? Um, so, uh, you a whole paper just on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so you know, thinking that this unprecedented type of latitude that we have, um, uh, of course, it's going to have all kinds of effects. So um, w- th- now just getting back to the two sort of horns of the explanation, let's start with the sociological. In part, I think, but maybe not entirely, but certainly in part, one of the upshots of this latitude is what I call the, uh, uh, the political saturation of social space, that um, because we've got this unprecedented latitude, it turns out, for all kinds of complicated reasons, um, not only are we making choices so that, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, we uh, are more likely to be inhabiting spaces that are fit for us, turns out that those same spaces are fit for people who are just like us, <laughs> right? It turns out, like, when you get control over the kinds of terms on which you go about your day, and you're able to control, you know, various, you know, factors about who you're going to interact with and what those interactions are going to be like and all the rest. Turns out people who are like you along other registers make, are making similar choices. Yeah. And so it seems as if then the sort of the aggregate upshot is that social spaces are becoming and have become in the United States and in other, you know, contemporary democracies have become um, increasingly uh, segregated along partisan lines. Now, this is a, a result that we, we first started paying attention to back in the 90s with Bill Bishop's book on the big sort. Um, but it turns out that it's become more pronounced and more tightly focused around partisan identification. Um, uh, so it turns out that in all kinds of surprising ways, um, you know, your consumer behavior, how you spend your weekends, you know, whether you have a passport, where you go on vacation and what you do on vacation, your occupation, what part of the country you live in, obviously, uh, what kind of house you live in or what kind of living space you have, how you decorate that space, whether you feed your pet wet or dry food. These are all things that are tightly, surprisingly, scarily tied <laughs> To your partisan identification, right? Uh, and by the way, you know, I, I could go through some of the, the, the surprising specifics, like, you know, the more clocks in your home, the more conservative you're likely to be, the more maps, the more liberal you're likely to be. So there are these, you know, and you could start weaving an, an explanatory story about that. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is that, um, yeah, well, you could see the, the, the broader point this way, you know, if you just pause for a moment and just think about, how much in the popular political vernacular uh, counts as political critique that is in fact merely mocking the other side's buying and consuming habits. 
right? So, you know, the camouflage versus the yoga pants, the hybrid <laughs> car versus the, the F-150, uh, the, uh, you know, this, kind, this coffee rather than the Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Yeah. Um, it turns out, by the way, that these are I all... that section of the book was really fascinating. Um, good, 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 good. So it turns out these are all very... Va- these, are, these are valenced politically. Uh, you know, the thing I... The, the, the bit about Starbucks, I think, is the most vivid. You know, Starbucks versus Dunkin' Donuts. You know, Starbucks... You, you walk into a Starbucks and so, wherever you are in the country, and in fact, wherever you are in the world, you walk into a Starbucks and it's clear somebody is trying to convince you that you are in a faraway place. <laughs> right? Somebody is trying to give you the momentary illusion of being in a different country. You know, now it turns out liberals conceive of themselves are as, as more cosmopolitan. They are more likely to have passports. They are more likely to travel outside of the country to go on vacation uh, than people who affiliate uh, conservative. Um, even by the way, uh, that, that, that doesn't skew um, uh, away uh, along um economic divisions. So you take economically similarly placed liberals and conservatives and you get this similar kinds of patterns, how far away you go uh, uh, on vacation uh, yeah. is, 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 is tightly tied to uh, your partisan identity. So, you know, the, the names of the drinks are these sort of like mashups of, you know, Italian, bullshit, Italian. bullshit Italian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good, good, good. Right. Grande, so, venti, yeah, all this kind yeah, of bullshit. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good, good, good. So there's this, <laughs> illusion of being someplace else the pictures on the walls are of tanzania and you know people gathering coffee beans now you just contrast that with the interior of a dunkin donuts in america um and just think the slogan of dunkin donuts america runs on dunkin right right? no illusion that there's something fancy about coffee right in fact coffee is the kind of thing that keeps you alert at work and they skew heavily conservative and so you could that simply think about, um, uh, you know, people, the, the, the stat is in the book. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not remembering it. Um, the number of districts that Barack Obama won that have whole foods in them. Oh, have a whole yeah, food yeah, store. Yeah. It's like staggering versus stack. a cracker barrel. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 McCain wins the cracker barrel places. Right. <laughs> right? Okay. So, so th- this sort of separating um, and coding of social spaces in ways that are t- tightly tethered to partisan identity, again, itself, I'm not even saying yet that this is objectionable. This is just like we make choices. This is the aggregate upshot of those choices, those um, – uh, you know, the things that, you know, the things that z- seem um, most convenient and most desirable to me will also seem kind of conten- convenient and desirable to people who are like me in certain respects. So I'm not yet complaining or objecting. Let me let me ask you one yeah. thing about this, about this aspect of it, because it's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> I understand that on the, that you don't want the tendency is to sort of blame the internet for all of this yeah. uh, because of its unique capacity for self-selection, right. And, and customization. Um, and I understand you're, you're wanting, you're wanting to resist that. Um, um, but I, I do wonder whether to a certain extent it's true. And, and here's the reason why I'm asking, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Um, there is a major trend certainly of the last 25 years that you would think would work against this phenomenon, right? That you're describing. Um, and that is the increasing necessity um, to be, to be mobile in your profession. That is that the days of your father worked in the factory in your town and you could spend the whole, your whole life working in the factory in this town, et cetera, is, are over. You look at data in terms of how many times people have to move in their professions. Right. Um, and it recalls to me, you know, People were worrying about this in the early 20th century. There's a famous line, and I, I don't remember which, which essay it's in, from Gilbert Chesterton, mm. who said, the best thing that could happen for social cohesion would be for people to be dropped at random down each other's chimneys <laughs> so that they would have to get along with whoever they found inside. So there was a recognition even way, way early that – that too much self-selection is not good for people in general right. for their attitudes. But so here's the question I have for you though, given that, look, I live in Springfield, Missouri. I don't live in, in New York. You live in Tennessee. You don't <laughs> live in New York. Listen to our accents, right? Yeah. that's right. Um, why hasn't the fact that 
people people disproportionately now have to move multiple times. They don't get to control where they live. Why hasn't that mitigated against what you're talking about, if not but for the fact that you can live in Tennessee but still be in New York because everything you do is online, I yes, guess is well, what I'm wondering. Good. So that's certainly part of it that, you know, there's a, you know, in one of the Federalist papers that we don't often read and certainly don't teach, so not 51 or 11 or, uh, or 10. Uh, you know, <laughs> Those are the only uh, two we teach, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I think it's Madison, uh, you know, makes this point about, um, the moderating effect of geographical space, right? So because even if you've got factions, there's going to be, you know, miles and miles of terrain separating off factions that could be allied with one another. You're not going to have a problem. Looks like the internet and maybe other kinds of uh, 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 um, technology has sort of, um, uh, and sort of counteracted that, right? That yeah. now, you know, geographical space doesn't really matter now, right? Okay. So, um, it turns out that, um, uh, th- just the, again, the sociological phenomena is such that, you know, part of the explanation is the one that you just offered that, you know, you can still, you know, read the you New live York. Live in Springfield, or, but still yeah, be in yeah, New yeah, York yeah, up yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. So that's, that's right. Thanks to the internet. But here's the other uh, interesting demographic feature is that, um, you know, uh, liberals who live in Nashville or live in Tennessee, let's say, you know, Nashville is a pretty liberal city in the middle of a red state. Um, liberals who live in Tennessee have more in common by way of lifestyle choices, consumer choices, the size of their family, the makeup of uh, other aspects of their social existence. They have more in common now with the liberals in New Jersey than they do with the conservatives who live on the other side of the town that they live in. What makes that possible, do you think? Why does place not have a greater effect on one's acculturation? Yeah, I think it goes back to, you know, and the, the Internet is, is part of the phenomenon. I think it's, it's we now have this latitude, yeah. right, over yeah. our lifestyle choices. We're not going, you know, we can make the world fit our sense of our own personal comfort. Yeah. And um, so, you know, the website 538 has a, you know, regular updates. I think they have an updated sort of app where you can see. Even in, this used to not be the case in large metropolises in the country, you know, L.A., New York, Chicago, even in, in New York and Chicago and L.A. now, you know, it's a melting pot. All kinds of different people live in New York City. But the actual districts where liberals and conservatives live are segregated, are segregating now. Right. So like, you're like Staten Island versus Manhattan. Yeah. Or, yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Or even sort of like, you know, that part of the, that part of the Upper East Side now yeah. is yeah. all of a sudden becoming, you know, yeah. more conservative and, yeah. you know, the people who live 10 blocks away, well, no, that's more liberal now. So people are choosing and again, I think these are the, the partisan sorting stuff is often an aggregate effect of more local feeling choices just about like, you know, it turns out, you know, liberals like sidewalks and places to walk to in their in their neighborhoods. Conservatives don't care much about that. They want more space. Right. So, you know, you can go with the Pew, the Pew Research Center has got you know updated stuff on this fairly regularly. It's really, really interesting. These are just lifestyle choices that have as their aggregate sort of byproduct the, you know, the broader partisan sorting of social spaces. Yeah. yeah. In ways that are not always obvious to us. Now, what I think is dem- democratically problematic about that is not merely the segregation stuff. It's just that, you know, yeah, casual unplanned encounters among people who are not alike politically are becoming more and more rare. And what that means is that our conception of who our political rivals are, what kind of people they are, what they are like, what they do, how they spend their days, that entire conception of our political opposition is provided for us by our political allies <laughs> and by our imagination. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Good. good. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so it's really easy to get a highly skewed uh, um, parochial conception of who those other people are and what they're like and what they do. Now that looks to me, you know, on the sort of maybe not a debilitating sort of uh, problem for democracy, 
but something that is um, slightly problematic in that, you know, there's roughly half of my fellow citizens. I've got this sort of imaginary or caricatured view of, you know, who they are and what they're like. Um, Now, Put that in, 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 in concert with um, this, th- this cognitive phenomenon, which is really where, where, where I think things start getting, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the threat of the argument starts getting more uh, obvious and I, th- I hope stronger. Um, so the belief polarization phenomenon, we know, you know studied for 60 years all over the world. It's, it's a cognitive phenomenon that lo- looks like it's sort of a cognitive version of a visual illusion. It doesn't vary much with, you know, race and gender and ethnicity and economic class and, you know, other factors that you might think it would. Um, it looks like it's a standing vulnerability that we're kind of, it doesn't vary, you know, along the demographic markers that you might initially expect it to. And it's kind of like a yes man phenomenon, you know, as um, you interact with like-minded others, you become a more extreme version of yourself. Now, often that's spelled out in ways that talk about, you um, uh, adopting more extreme versions of your be- the beliefs that you held before you interacted with a group that is like-minded with respect to that belief. Um, and in some experimental settings, that is sort of what the phenomenon is. You could see this sort of injury. Uh, uh, could you give a con- – I mean, I, I find this very intuitive, but could you give a concrete example? Because you do in the book um, of just a, an example of where – one becomes a hardened version of what one already was um, in terms of a specific belief or attitude or whatever. So, yeah. So, take one from the, one of the book. I mean, you could use. Yeah. yeah so in, yeah. there, there've been a lot of experiments with juries. This is one way where you could see the, the, the effect really clearly. Um, you know, you ask before the jury goes into the experimental, the, the mock jury goes into deliberation. You ask each of the jurors, you know, if it turns out that this guy is guilty of this particular infraction, and, you know, if you think that you think that if he is guilty of that, in fact, it's a serious crime. Um, so you get the people who think that the, if he's guilty, he's committed a serious crime. And then you ask them, well, what kind of punitive damage should he, you know, award should he have to pay? And they'll give, you know, a number, you know, $10,000. And then you say, well, do you think that maybe he should have to pay 20000 And, you know, they say, no, no, 20000 is is excessive, 10000 Okay. You get the jurors together, and if they all agree that the guy is guilty and the infraction is particularly egregious, not only do each of them move to be more punitive, the longer they talk, the more of them exceed the threshold that they set, right? They outbid they, each other. Yeah, they go beyond what they said was excessive before they started speaking. Another similar kind of example has to do um, with experiments involving um, – uh, political activists, um, where you, you know, you get people who are engaged in activist projects of particular kinds that say, you know, they're, they're, um, they're interested in, uh, 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 in counteracting police brutality and you get them together like, well, what, you know, imagine the following situation, you know, this sort of trend of, uh, of, uh, racially intoned police brutality has occurred in your city. You know, what do you think your group should do? And they'll say various kinds of things about, you know, what level of disobedience, what level of law breaking, what level of organization, where things should happen. You know, they'll give some kind of answer. And then you say, like, do you think that you should, you know, set fire to cop cars? No, 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 no. We shouldn't do that kind of thing. That would be excessive. Then you get them together. Right. And not only do they come to feel that the um, infraction is far more serious and injustice than what they said before, they start advocating for more extreme positions, including the positions that they said would be excessive and beyond the pale. So it looks as if in this kind of case, not only do you get like with the jurors, like I'm willing to make you, yeah, I'm willing to be more punitive, but also in our own cases, we're willing to engage in more risky forms of behavior, right? On the basis of um, interactions that, might not involve 
the dissemination of any new information. Right. Okay? That it doesn't look like what's driving it is, you know, you get new, you get the people together and they start pooling their information and then you learn new things. And on the basis of the, those new facts, you say, wow, this is far worse than I thought. It looks as if it's, um, you know, as Cass Sunstein sort of puts it, it's like these are cascades. It's just, you know, we sort of like, um, as the British say, we wind each other up in a way, right? And that in- starts intensifying, uh, uh, um, you know, not only beliefs, but I would go on to say, you know, attitudes, you know, the, the attitudes we have, uh, uh, we get angrier, uh, uh, we get, um, uh, you know, more indignant, more resentful, uh, depending on the case. Um, and as I argue in the book, or at least I, I, I try to argue in the book, because let, let me just say one quick thing for the philosophers. Um, this is a robust social scientific and cognitive scientific literature that's, you know, 50, 60 years old or 60 years old now. And it's really, really interesting on the phenomenon. It's really, really, the experiments are cool. It's really worth looking at. The trouble is that the kinds of distinctions that we as philosophers would make are almost entirely absent. Yeah. So just to give one example of this, you could read a lot of this um, group in belief polarization literature and, you know, as I started working through it all, I found myself just sort of like, you know, Mark, I, I wish I had some of the, some of the off prints because I get a big red circle, just like, this is a conflation of degree of belief with belief content, right? So they're talking always about, you know, they become more extreme. Like, okay, what does that mean? Well, in some cases, it means you become more fervent, right? You become a more, you know, sort of rabid advocate for what you believe. Yeah, in other cases, that the content becomes more... Ex- that's, yeah. that's right. And so, you know, what I try to do in the book, and, you know, um, uh, one of the reviewers in Oxford, I'm going to just put this out there. I don't know. Who one of the reviewers in Oxford was driven nuts by this part of the book and just thought yeah, this was like, probably a political philosopher. You know, it was just like, you know, it gets into all this stuff about the difference between degrees of belief and content of belief. And, you know, if you've got a shift in content of belief, that's not really right to say that there's been an uptick in degree of belief because you need a, a, a constant content in order to measure it. You know, I get into all that. Like, yeah, just get rid of that. <laughs> get rid of, get that out of the book. And I, I, you know, I did not because it's an important part of the book. Anyway, so, you know, this is something for a graduate student out there really wants to, like, looking for a dissertation topic. Here's one of those cases where philosophical nuance could be introduced into this longstanding cognitive yeah, philosophy of social school. science work to be done. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, but, you know, leaving all those sort of niceties aside, the argument that I wind up or the, the position that I wind up taking on belief polarization is that it's a, it's a more human phenomenon than it looks, uh, than, than it's often presented because it's not ultimately about sharing information or face to face contact, contact or trying to sort of fit in with a group of others who you, you don't want to look like you're a poser in front of, you know, these are uh, the contexts in which the phenomenon has been studied and this is sort of, you know, you're looking where the light's on problem, right? So because you can study the phenomenon in cases of like-minded discussion or in cases of certain kinds of group dynamics where pressures to detect, you know, inauthentic posers, you know, are yeah. kind of high, then, you know, people say, oh, so this is an informational dynamic or this is a social dynamic about conforming groups and wanting to seem authentic and desirably distinctive right. in a group. Those are good places to produce and study the phenomenon. Turns out that you can get the phenomenon in the absence of any face-to-face encounter at all. Turns out you can get the phenomenon simply in virtue of making salient to a subject a social identity that she holds and presenting her with a chart that shows people who have that identity think this thing that you think. No information is exchanged. Do you think that that's because... Is that something and en- sort of endemic or is that because in the internet age, people are hyper aware that they could come under the scrutiny of their peers very easily? So or is that, you think, something that's sort of indigenous, so to speak, would yeah, have been so, true 100 years ago as much as today? I think it would have been that's true. That's obviously a guess, but yeah, I mean, what's yeah, your guess? Yeah. No, I think it would have been true 100 years ago. Um, I think that the the kind of forces that you're now pointing to exacerbate this, right? Because you, you know, we're, you know, you don't want to be canceled. You don't want to get a thumbs down. You don't want to be unfriended or whatever it is that people, you know, whatever the kids are doing these days, right? <laughs> so, you know, so those are pressures. I would say that, you know, part of what explains 
why these features of our social media platforms are so addicting to us is mm. because there's a phenomenon, there's an underlying yeah. phenomenon yeah. that it's feeding, yeah. which is that, you know, just to put it very bluntly, I mean, this is not really technical science now, right? To put it really bluntly, we like to feel good about ourselves and it makes us feel good about ourselves when we find out that people who we see ourselves as being like, Agree with we us. Find out that yeah, we find out that hey, like th- th- you know, that makes me part of the team because you know I think this thing and they think it too, and there's where the human part comes in. Like, I feel good about myself. I sort of feel elevated. Like my mood goes up. It's like, and that's how you get an uptick in confidence in your overall perspective, as I call it. I'm not saying you get an uptick in degree of belief because the belief shift, you become, a, you become more confident as a thinker, uh, you know, sort of there's a Dunning Kruger sort of aspect, become more confident. And that's why you start asserting um, uh, with greater confidence, more extreme versions of your commitment because yeah. it's just because you feel better. Um, you also, by the way, uh, as a product of this um, intensification, uh, you come to hold more negative affects towards the people who you see as outside. They might not even be outside. These are the people who are perceived to be outsiders. You come to find them strange and qu- curious and weird, inscrutable, in cases yucky and disgusting and all the rest. Um, you come to attribute to the other side an unreasonable degree of homogeneity that is you start seeing the other side as just you know, what republicans think is and then you say some the often, left yeah yeah the, good, good, left good. the, the liberals yeah, think yeah, yeah, right yeah. and then what you get in that blank then is what perhaps only a small segment of the most extreme liberals think but then it's sort of like a, a you know it's like one of these fallacies of composition like you, it, the most extreme yeah. version of the other side becomes the mainstream view around which everybody is um, either overtly or secretly uh, allied, yeah. you become less willing to, you know, become less willing to hear what they have to say. Like there's these experiments where once you find out that the person is not a co-partisan, you shut them down, you stop yeah. listening, you stop paying attention. Like um, the, ar- the archetype is not the average, but the most um, pronounced. That's exactly um, right. And, and as we know that the way to counteract that is to, make it very demonstrable to people that actually the archetype is the average. I mean, I'm, what I'm thinking about is the pretty remarkable shift in attitudes uh, 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 towards gay people. Right. Um, um, and that was, that, that, that was affected to a great degree by the um, far greater exposure to gay people in media and, and, and across the board to where everybody could see, Oh, it's not the person in a feather boa, you know, with, with like a leather like thong on marching. It's, it's a guy in a suit with a tie going to work. Right. Um, um, and I guess, I guess what, what you're describing here really does sort of go, go to deep things that we already kind of know about how propaganda works and how you can get a population to turn against another population through propaganda and caricatures and also, um, um, uh, how do you get uh, the entire German public to turn on its Jews? Well, you published your Sturmer and every day they're seeing pictures of, so, I mean, what you're describing is well known. Do you feel like everybody just has collective amnesia? Why do we, why are we not guarded against this given that we've known about a lot of these forces for the whole so, 20th century, right? I mean, um, um, yeah. So, you know, it's a good question. And, you know, I, I, again, this is a, there, there, we'll agree, there couldn't be a simple answer to this question, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Whatever the answer is going to be, it's got to be, you know, a, a, a lot of little moving parts that together sort of fit together in the right way. So, um, I want to say this, you know, for reasons that um, the kind of sort of um, the, the story about the, 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 the greater control we have over our environment is going to be part of this. You know, connected to that is the thought that um, uh, our political identities have become more central to our overall sense of our social selves over the past 25, 30 years. Why? I, I'm not exactly sure what the right explanation What's of this is. What's your guess, your hunch? But, so my guess is that, um, here's my hunch. Um, uh, the 
the people who make a lot of money, you know, orchestrating campaigns and handling um, uh, uh, candidates um, discovered that the people who are selling us toothpaste in cars have figured out a couple of things about how to extract behavior from people. So the importing of advanced marketing techniques into politics. That's right. And Mm. right. And so, um, you know, it, it corresponds with a point at which at least at the national level, but at certain local levels as well, winning elections is a matter of extracting behavior. It's not a matter of changing minds, right? It's not a matter of, it's a matter of getting people out to the polls. It's a matter of turnout. Um, and that's increasingly the case uh, in our democracy. It's, you don't have to change anybody's mind. You just have to get the people who are already on your side to actually show up. And, you know, the, the, if you can do that better than the other guy, you're going to win. Okay. So that's that's got to be part of the story. And so that um, lifestyle, consumption, um, uh other kinds of choices that we make are now seen as expressions of our deep sense of self and that politics has made it such that that deep sense of self is now is now more likely to be understood in terms of liberal or conservative than it was 30 years ago in terms of Christian or Jew, for example, right? There's a really interesting this is a side note to sort of spell this thought out. Really interesting book by Michelle Margolis, a political scientist at Penn, um, where she, uh, about, it's called From uh, Politics to the Pews, by the way. Um, you know, we think of the ways in which, especially uh, Protestant denominations, maybe particularly evangelical denominations, have become politicized, right? Become more politically activist, you know, through the 80s and 90s and up to today. You know, we think that that story is a story that runs something like, well, there are these things called the culture wars and the um, – uh, uh, the pastors start feeling that their traditional values are under attack in the broader culture, and the response that they take is to start interjecting more overtly political messaging in their preaching, and so eventually you get the partisan segregation of the congregations that you would get, uh, that you would expect, but ultimately it's a reaction to, reaction from the pastors to the culture wars. This book suggests that that's almost backwards. Hmm. That what happens in the 80s and 90s is that congregants start showing up on Sundays or Wednesday or Saturdays or Wednesday evenings or whenever it is that things happen at the at the church. Um, Congregants start showing up wanting their partisan identities affirmed by their pastor, wanting the partisan identity to be part of their understanding of worshiping their God. And it turns out that you see, when the, the data show that um, uh, pastors who refused to do that lost their congregations. Yeah. It's right? a reaction to a market demand, not the opposite. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. it. So I think that the broader story, and I don't know all the mechanisms, the broader story has to do with the centering of our partisan identity so that it becomes uh, more and more coterminous with our sense of our social selves overall and I think, by the way, just you know, one upshot of this, one sort of you know, um, sort of problematic from the point of view of democracy upshot is this: is is that, yeah, well, you know, when candidates are sold like toothpaste is sold, and when we are primed in this way to see, think of ourselves as liberals or conservatives or Democrats or Republicans or you know, <laughs> you know, there's a Monty Python joke, right? Uh, yeah, I'm a, a I'm I'm a Trotskyite Marxist. No, I'm a Marxist Trotskyite, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Once we think in these Judea terms, liberation from yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Once we think in these terms, it's really good from the point of view of marketing candidates. Yeah. Right. It's really good from the point of view of the people who are trying to extract behavior from us when they can count on large parts of the population or in particular regions, large parts of the population having a similar kind of self-conception that makes it really easy to know how to advertise to them, how to stroke their fears, how to get them angry, makes it makes us easy to manipulate. I mean, this gets back to the the sort of propaganda edge of the question. Yeah. It sort of makes us easy to to sort of um, uh, to sort of lead around, right? <laughs> when you know, if you're dr- if you're drinking Starbucks and living in this part of the city, and you're you know 
you're worried about X, Y, and Z, and you're, you think the following thing. If you're living in that part of the city and you drive the Ford and, you know, then, you know, you got a problem. You, you think that there's a caravan that's coming to invade the United States from the southern border, right? And so it, it sort of makes us rubes in a way. Do you think, to what, I mean, I'm starting to wonder whether this is kind of an inevitable product of sort of late capitalism, right? I mean, in the sense that it just seems like there's been a, and this is why I asked you at the beginning about the sort of the Robert Putnam problem, the extent to which the diminishing of, of people's relationships and relationship networks are ultimately to blame for this. I mean, cause you know, it's a sort of a well-known thing is that, you know, um, the less I've, the less I have in my sort of informal life, the more I demand of the formal parts of my life to provide it. Right? You know, if I don't have any friends, then what I do is I push for politics in which people are forced to at least act like they're my friends. Right? <laughs> um, 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 you know, you must reaffirm my identity, and I'm going to sue you if you don't, or have the police come to your house, or whatever. Um, I, I just wonder whether sort of we've under, you know we've been undergoing a very long process of the kind of the shrinking of our relationships from extended to, to nuclear to now and 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 that the result has been that we look more and more to the formal aspects of our lives the the, the, the you know in other words as the civil society shrinks diminishes becomes less and less um satisfying uh for us to participate in we look more and more to the political to 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 fill the space I and mean, do you think that there's something to that that this yeah. is a sort of an inevitable result of this long process that we've been undergoing, at least since I would say the beginning of the 20th century, the industrialization. And so, yeah, I think that that's got to be part of the story. And nothing that I want, nothing that I affirm, um, nothing in the thesis of the book is meant to be um, uh, um, uh, meant to be a competitor with more straightforwardly economic analyses. Right of the the phenomena, right? And All even of, suburbanization you can yeah. see as a, as a as a force for separating and sort of you know isolating and no no longer common public spaces where everybody's interacting all the time, right? I that's mean, right. That's um, right. And you um, can tell that sort of Michael Walzer kind of story where it's that's like right. Yeah. Right. The common spaces have become increasingly commercial spaces, right? right. It's the right. shopping mall where right. people see one another. And that's very self-selecting. It's very, very self-selecting. Yeah, yeah. And it's also a place where, yeah, well, you know, I, it, there's a shopping mall where the liberals go to, and there's a shopping mall where the non-liberals go to. So the idea that there would be sort of a public sphere where citizens would interact qua citizen, right? Not through a filter that is already sort of, you know, um, uh, segregating them according to their political allegiances or alliances, yeah, that that's all um, uh, uh, deteriorated. And just to make the Robert Putnam point, right? You know, the the the, the uh, you know the the the, um, the dissolving of a rich sort of culture of bowling leagues, right? You know, these are one of these spaces where this is the kind of space where you know when we were kids and where our parents were, were were growing up for sure. You know, there were bowling leagues. You know, who sure. are the guys on the other teams? You might not know them. You might not know where they live. You might not know what they do for a living. They're just, you know, people who you've got to engage in. You know, this, you know, I think it's easy to overlook the significance of these kinds of micro interactions that are based in cooperation and sharing an activity. I think it's They're easy enormous. To They're yeah, enormous. Yeah, I think it's really, really important. The Robert Putnam phenomenon is, yeah, people still bowl but they no longer are doing it in ways that exposes them to others who they haven't selected in advance. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. doing it with people where they don't have to meet new people or figure yeah. out how to engage with new people. So I'm really sympathetic to at least that part of the Putnam, uh, the Robert Putnam story. Um, you know, there are other, there are other features of, of yeah. his story that I'm a little bit less right. uh, moved by. Right. Um, but so that's part of it. But I, I, I want to stress this because, um, you know, again, you can read a whole lot of democratic theory, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, from Dewey on up or maybe before Dewey on up, you can read a whole lot of democratic theory and walk away with the thought that, um, you know, anything that's going wrong with democracy has to be owed to 
you know, failing to live up to the ideals, you know, yeah. deviating from the ideals, allowing some alien ideals to sort of infiltrate. This is like the Walzer short infiltrate right. the democratic right. space. And, you know, certainly that's the right diagnosis, I think, for a lot of what's going wrong with democracy today. I hope in the book to say, well, wait a minute, but there are vulnerabilities that beset or threaten democracy internally. It's like, even if people are doing roughly what they should be doing as democratic citizens, getting together with like-minded others to build coalitions, to think through the things that they care about, to signal in public to others that they are allied with different kinds of projects. Like these are all things that I don't think you could take away from a society and still claim it's a constitutional democracy or liberal democracy in the philosophical sense, right? It's like, yeah, people are doing roughly what they should be doing. And it creates its own kind of pathology, right? Yeah. That it's, it doesn't look to me like it's that democracy is threatened always from some alien yeah. set of norms. Yeah. The way in which the democratic norms, when pursued in such a way with a certain kind of intensity to the exclusion of other kinds of things, other kinds of goods and pursuits and cooperative activities, they become pathological all on their own. Yeah. And actually, you know, in this regard, I think my own party, uh, the Democratic Party, is suffering for this the worst right now. And that is because of the forces you're describing, the result, one of the results has been is that we, only, we find ourselves only able to form smaller coalitions, right? That's right. I mean, I mean, you know, you now have a struggle between the traditional labor wing and the social justice wing, right? I mean, that's been a struggle that was born back, back in the days of McGovern, right? I mean, I mean, and you're seeing, you know, to where labor eventually migrates over to the Republicans. Um, um, and in Britain, labor's just migrated over to the Tories, right? And that's partly because the forces you're describing have diminished the capacity yeah. to form large yeah. coalitions yeah. because of the purity requirements that are sort of applied that are the result of the forces you talk about in the book. This is exactly right. So let me just yeah. say, you know, yeah. the Please. next book, the next book project, right? It's just, uh, there's a follow up coming, uh, uh, to this book. Um, so overdoing democracy is focused on these phenomena understood as dynamics that screw up the relations between, um, Groups of partisans and the citizens who don't share that partisan identity, right? The, the polarization phenomenon combined with the saturation stuff makes it the case that it becomes increasingly diff harder and harder and harder to see those who aren't just like me as entitled to equal citizenship. Right. But you're just pointing out now that the, 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 the part that's, you know, in, in the book, in the water, we could say in the book, in the air in the book, but not fully spelled out, but they're really, really cool data on this is exactly what part of the polarization phenomenon under conditions of saturation is also that we come to overpopulate. The, the our sense of who's on the other side, right? People who aren't yep. just like us down to every minute detail now they, become now enemies. Apostates, they get chucked. They good, good, good. So part of the polarization phenomenon is also not merely that we become more extreme, we do, but also that our group becomes increasingly homogeneous by attrition, by expelling more and more people. Because as we become more extreme, the pressures to detect posers right? Intensify, right? Yeah. The, the rhino and dino talk, right? right. Republican in name only, d Democrat in name only, yeah. shoot up. The voting for Biden, you might as well vote for Trump, right? Kind of, right. You see this kind right. of stuff a right. lot now. Right. Like, this is a dynamic that's real. We've got an explanation for it. It's got a real cognitive element to it. And note, as you were just saying, okay, it's a, it's a real gift to your opponents. Uh, it makes it harder for you to get anything done. And even in cases where that kind of intensely homogeneous, uh, uh, um, strat, homo uh, homogenizing strategy politically succeeds, it becomes harder for the successes to be lasting because you deteriorate in yourself right. the kinds of capacities that are necessary for getting along with people after you win. Right? You, you can't, can't govern. You can't yeah, govern. That's exactly. Yeah. You can't forget that. If, no. So, you know, let's um, – Let's 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 be optimistic for a moment. Yeah, sure. And maybe not too optimistic, but you know, someday Trumpism will be defeated. Let's just let's just assert that. I, I happen to think it's true. Someday Trumpism will be defeated. The real question is whether 
the capacities that we have individually and as partisans to do democracy with the people that were on the other side of that battle after we've won. Like that's a real democratic and a, that's a, that's a longer term political question that the phenomenon, the, the phenomena that I'm identifying force us to lose sight of. Everything becomes about the, where do you stand at this particular moment given what's just happened? I did an experiment, by the way. I, didn't, I shouldn't call it an experiment. When uh, back in the, the last presidential election, when you know daily things were coming out, calling you know that were calls for outrage and partisan uh, uh, um, indignation. So the the Access Hollywood tape, the the basket of deplorables comment, you know these kinds of things were happening daily, and you know. Um, Nashville is an interesting city in all kinds of ways, but people just talk to one another. You know, it's unlike New York where you can spend the whole day and not be, uh, not really be interactive. People just chit chat, you know, uh, among strangers. And, um, so, you know, you're waiting online at the grocery store or whatever, and people would just say, oh, have you, did you see what the, did you see what Donald Trump just did? Or did you hear what's going on with Hillary? Or, do, you know, did she, I think she might have had a stroke. I remember right. that. Or, yeah. So people are saying these kinds of things. And inviting, you know, they want to size you up where you stand on stuff. And I started saying, just as a kind of like informal experiment, I started saying like, yeah, I'm not sure what to think about that yet. Yeah, oh no, I saw that. I heard that. I read that. What the reaction would be? Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not sure what to say about that yet. And what would you get? The, oh, what do you oh, mean? What are you talking about? That's yeah, 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 good, good. So on the one hand, it was like, yeah, to take a moment to try to think about what your reaction should be proves that you're complicit or that, you know, so there was that kind of response, right? That that the right reaction isn't something that's obvious on its face proves that you're screwed up politically. <laughs> Other fairly common response was, um, well, if you don't know what to think about it, you must not know what happened. So let me tell you what happened. Well, what happened is, and you say, no, no, I know, I, I know what happened. So again, the idea that what it feel, it must feel like political engagement, right? But in fact, it's, and again, you can see how the social media stuff sort of is training us in these ways. It's like, put the thumb up or down click on the little heart guy or don't retweet or don't friend or cancel. Right. So it's like this sort of like, yeah, let's try and make a political virtue of this is stuff, by the way, that the philosopher Michael Lynch likes to talk about and does, does a good job of it. Right. Let's try to short circuit any moment for the exercise of judgment. (laughs) Right. That's part of the, the partisan and the polarization story too, is that no, you know, something has just happened. You've got to have your hot take because what's really important in light of this political thing that happened is signaling and affirming and expressing your partisan identity. And it's always going to be clear what the right partisan reaction is going to be. And if you say, well, wait a minute, let me think a little bit about that. You're showing yourself to be a kind of inauthentic po- or opposing. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a poser, right? You're not really on, on board. And it just looks to me like it's... It, democratically dysfunctional because it's so short-sighted you're constantly just reacting to the thing that's happening in the moment yeah. by the way this creates really um strategic opportunities uh for the president who knows that this is what's happening and is constantly feeding us yeah. right i mean these things that like every day i'm I, there's something you're letting yourself like, get baited man it's yeah, just this, like, exactly know. right it's just- like, <laughs> Remember the days like, you know, I, 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 I didn't, <laughs> I didn't like either George Bush, right? But I remember, you know, being an adult, you know, and saying like a couple of day, days would go by where I would not have to think or talk or utter the president's name, right? Right. right. This is no longer the case yeah. and it's a strategy and we're vulnerable to, um, being primed and, and, and falling and being hooked by this strategy yeah. because so much of the politics is, given its partisan and polarized nature, so much of the politics is aimed at establishing with the people who you want to signal your allegiance to that you're one of them. And yeah. one of the things I wind up saying and exploring in the, in the follow-up to Overdoing Democracy is sort of like, it looks to me like the following might be true. 
the more central our partisan identities are to our overall sense of our social identity, the thinner the conception of politics has to become. Yeah. Right. You get this super like razor thin conception of what politics is all about. It's about the canceling and the liking and the friending and the unfriending and which ultimately does nothing. But that goes to that issue of how rich or not rich your personal life is. Right. And, and your, and your relationships are. Um, 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 and so in closing, let's, let's, let's close, start to close out. Let's mm-hmm. talk about your, 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 your analysis of some of the sort of potential remedies. The reason why I raised the Robert Putnam question and asked you about these deeper forces is they do go to the question of, of, of the issue of remedies, because if it's the case that ultimately what's going on are very deep forces that begin with industrialization, it makes me less hopeful about the potential for remedies that, that are going to only operate maybe at the surface, right? Right. And aren't going to, aren't going to involve a fundamental reorganization, right? So maybe you could talk a little bit about the, 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 the remedies you discuss in the book and what you kind of think has to, would have to happen yeah. in order for these to be for these to be sort of realistic expectations. So, yeah, and uh, let me just say, the book is not altogether optimistic. <laughs> right, yeah. You offer at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think that um, uh, one, one strategy that I think is important just to say I don't think will be sufficient because it helps me sort of spell out the, the more direct answer to your question the um, the initiatives that are very popular, by the way, in Washington D.C. think tanks and elsewhere, uh, these sort of civility initiatives, where you know invite your invite your political enemy over to lunch and you know join a softball game that's got Republicans and Democrats and all that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not resisting these things. You know, I'm not saying don't do those things. And maybe they're good to do. You know, whatever. They're just not sufficient because those are all activities that remain that that keep politics at the center of the 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 aim right what we, it's part of what we're doing is political when we are playing softball with our political rivals um so two things that i wind up saying at the end of the book that are are, are really important and the first is uh you know it was at a, a a thing last week in new york with uh the journalist oliver berkman who's written about um uh, yep. self-help and he said he said, i did a dialogue with him too oh yeah, yeah he's yeah. he's a really really sharp guy yeah he, he said yeah he said you know look you got this almost like self-help thought because you know part of the prescription is that you've got to work on yourself by recognizing your vulnerability to the phenomena right and but you know I'm, i'll own that that seems to me right you know I, for you know, many years before I started writing the book, you know, I was interested in the belief polarization phenomena. You know, give talks to people about you know uh, belief polarization in political contexts, and you know, it's part of the phenomena. It's part of many cognitive phenomena that you can see it in others, but you can't see it in yourself, right? You can only infer it in yourself. Yeah. You can see others become extreme. You know, and that's a, the echo you know, chambers, the Fox you News. Know, trust and assume that it's operating in yourself. That you're this not is special. exactly right. Right. So I say, <laughs> so I say, look, it. the yeah. first step is to recognize that you're vulnerable to this stuff too. And it's yeah. just a mistake to think that you're somehow exempt from this cognitive sort of foible. Um, I say carefully to, to point out, I said, that doesn't mean that in recognizing your own vulnerability, you have to moderate your political commitments so that they're more welcoming of and more ready to say the people on the other side might have a point. So that you don't have to do that. What you have to do though, is recognize that your conception of what those other people are like and who they are and how much variation there is among them in their commitments. That all needs to be rehabilitated. That is very likely to be heavily influenced by your vulnerability to this phenomenon under the material conditions that you live. And let's face it, I should say the polarization phenomenon and the saturation phenomenon, perhaps unsurprisingly in the latter case, the more politically active you take yourself to be, the more vulnerable you become to them, right? So you can imagine. Okay, good. So that's the first step is kind of recognize that this is about you and not just another way to own the people on the other side by calling them belief polarized, politically saturated zombies. Another thing wrong with the people you're against. Yeah, that, right? That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Now here's the harder thing that, you know, it's whenever I give talks on this, there's always people in the audience uh, who think that this is incoherent. Um, and this is, it's sort of like worse than a modus ponens, modus tollens problem, because it's like that you think this is incoherent looks to me like a confirmation of the diagnosis rather than 
a counterexample. So the idea that I say, look, as odd as it may sound, if we want to start doing better democratic politics, we have to find, and if we can't find, which is likely the case, you have to build new venues for social cooperative activities in which politics is just not part of the profile of what you're doing. Yeah, you bowling leagues you have in mind in that sort of area. So, so let me just say, like bowling leagues. That's bowling a- bowling leagues used to play this role. The American workplace used to be far more, and, and across different um, different kinds of workspaces, different kinds of professions. Yeah. The American workplace used to be far more politically heterogeneous than it is. You're right now, it's incredibly homogeneous across. You know. Uh, again, across all the economic strata, you know, the, the, and again, you know, your You're dentist right. is like your dentist is likely to be liberal. Your foot doctor is likely to be conservative. I mean, it goes down, it boils down to those kinds of yeah. trends in professions. So, you know, workplaces, um, families, um, uh, community spaces of all kinds used to be far more politically heterogeneous than they are today, and some of them are excessively and surprisingly homogeneous. They're not just less heterogeneous than they were. They sort of crossed over to being homogeneous to a sort of surprising degree. So what I say is we've got to build spaces and occupy uh, venues and find activities to engage in, not where we suppress our differences, but activities in which our political well, politics just is don't just arrive. not, the just not, just not what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Now, People, when I say this, and it tends to be in academic audiences that I'm just inferring are more likely to be audiences that contain members that are politically more like me, so more left-leaning audiences, think this is an incoherent, crazy thought because it's all politics and the idea that there could be some activity that's not itself an expression of politics is some kind of, um, you know, round square kind of thought. That strikes me as just the symptom. It's like, the, no, like, I, so here's just to give an example of something that uh, my wife and I actually started doing, not because I wrote this book and we figured we had to do something, but because, um, you know, the last presidential election left us really worried about, you know, we, we needed to do something to get us away from the news, actually. And, you know, we live in Nashville, uh, as you know, um, uh, you know, we're not from the South. Um, and as you might also know, bluegrass music is not my preferred um, genre of, sure. <laughs> of pop music. Yeah, pop, Robert and I have been bonding on Twitter over our love for punk rock bands. <laughs> <It's> um, true. <laughs> <laughs> Robert's before a weekly punk rock uh, uh, selection. selection. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, but... So you're starting to go to country music shows and stuff now to sort of... We go to a bluegrass club. Yeah. And, you know, look, it, it's, it, it, I don't own the records. People probably. Different, yeah. yeah, different. Yeah. I, I don't know. Look, I, I don't think about it. I don't know. I suspect that the people who show up uh, for this open bluegrass jam, which is unbelievably, it's, it's unbelievably talented players. Yeah, the skill you level know, is ridiculous. It's yeah. ridiculous, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not like going to a, a club when we were kids in New York and there was a cover band. And you're like, yeah, these guys can't play. Like in, <laughs> in, in Nashville, everybody who's playing for free or for tips is also a studio musician. So the musicianship is super, super high quality. And, you know, the, the other people, you sit around at these sort of picnic-like benches. It's a kind of divey place. And, um, uh, you know, whoever shows up gets to sit in. And, you know, sometimes it's like eight different upright bass players and a couple of mandolin players or whatever. But the people who intend this thing are ready to talk all about what's going on on the stage. Right? They want to talk about the songs always have a story about who wrote them and who they wrote them with and why they wrote them and what different players perform that song. And the mandolin player was playing on a, you know, Emmylou Harris record when blah, blah. So they're all this, it's, it's a story genre where it's a pretty tight knit community of people and their musicianship, you know, and Maybe I've got reason to suspect that a lot of the people in the audience who I wind up having conversations with about the mandolin player and what was the, what was the guy playing the harmonica doing and, you know, what kind of song is that and what's the song structure like? You know, I don't know what their politics are like. If I thought about it and had to guess, they're probably to my right, but I have no idea because it's just not part of the conversation. The yeah. conversations are about the musicians and the songs and the music and 
as a result of those interactions, like, hey, you know, that guy who shows up at that, that club once a week for this bluegrass jam, he doesn't play anything, but he just sits there and listens. Like, this guy's got a really sensitive ear. And yeah. this guy's got a really sophisticated right. way of interacting with live music that enables him to just point out things that are going on and that, you know, were part of the performance that, you know, I would never have been sensitive to, never thought about, never picked up on. So you put yourself in a position not just to potentially mix with people that are from the opposite side of things politically, but in a, in a position where you are decidedly in the inferior position, where yeah. they are in a position to educate you about something. That's right. And that, that, that strikes me as very smart. I mean, that, that sort of, it's, yeah, that operates at a subconscious almost kind of level in terms of how you think of the other person then. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, if I were to find out about any of these people, that, what their politics are like, and if their politics are what, you know, I suspect they probably are like, I still think that they're politically, demonstrably you know, misguided, right? right? I right. think but like. What you won't think is they're animals and fools, is what you that's won't think. Exactly right. I can't see them as having horns coming out of their head. I can't see them as across the board, deluded, irrational, inscrutable. Why? Because this guy's got an aesthetic sensibility in this context that no far outstrips that mine. About. Yeah. Yeah. And, right. and yeah. these guys up on the stage, whatever songs they're playing, whatever, like this is a guy who's mastered a, a musical instrument far beyond what any of the people who are my favorite players are capable of. That's right. And this, so there are distinct kinds of virtues, intellectual and otherwise, that are on display in a context where it's not a, not about politics. I mean, I don't know what they think of me. They probably like, yeah, that guy looks like he's you know, wearing a tweed jacket, he's a professor somewhere, whatever. Maybe they're like, yeah, he's a lefty. I don't know what they think. Yeah, it just doesn't come up because yeah. it's like, wow, that was an amazing, what an what an amazing acoustic guitar player. Oh yeah, now that guy's played with, and then you get this rule like, oh, that guy's played on every record that you know, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Justin Towns Van, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Steve Earle, he's Steve Earle's player. You know, they, they constantly are just like connecting all these people just show up yeah. at this club to other things. So like, my goodness, like this guy's got, these people have got a sensitivity that uh, is admirable. And so it's just hard to see them as um, in virtue of their politics, despite how misguided I think that uh, their politics may be. Yeah. It's hard to see them as just failed people. On the final note, um, is there anything you think institutionally that can be done or is this something that's really going to require people? Yeah, I think it's got to like what you're doing. I mean, or, or is this, is there something institutionally that can be done? Is there something structurally that can be changed? You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. Uh, um, so I, I think that, um, uh, yes, but I think that the, the, um, the actual work at this point, given where I think, the country's at it's an empirical question whether i'm right that these phenomena are as severe as i think they are but let's just assume that they are pretty severe uh so i'll just give one kind of example early version of of a talk when i was starting to work on the book um somebody asked uh in the audience you know what should we do and uh, i said well you know i don't know why don't you just you know go volunteer you know volunteer to pick up uh garbage from the the park uh, the person said, well, that would be a liberal thing to do, right? Now, it, there's a longer version of the story where, like, I, I give the incredulous stare. It's like, like conservatives <laughs> like junk, I, you know, and sort of went on to the next question. I think I failed at that point. Like, I should have figured out, like, what do you mean? Like, you know, you mean it's liberal to volunteer with a community organization rather than a church? It's liberal to volunteer to pick up junk rather than to feed the homeless. You know, what exactly do you mean is liberal in this? Is it the priority? Is it the, so one thing that um, I've learned to sort of uh, avoid in talking about the book is sort of, again, it's part of being aware of your own sort of vulnerability to this. Like, I don't want to just say, look, you know, here's what, here's how things should be, you know, here's what should happen because it's going to be in part an expression of some of these forces that I'm right. not, you know, that I'm only indirectly aware of that are working on me. So what I want to say is that, yeah, the, the real work that has to get done now has got to be of the kind that I described with the Bluegrass Club. Put yourself in situations, not where you're a danger or you're going to like, expose yourself and your vulnerabilities to the people who are out to, you know, uh, deny you your rights and, you know, not talking about that, 
just saying, like, go find things to do together where, you know, the people can be on your side politically. That's not the, it's not to go like find your enemies and go do things with them. It's to just find things to do with people where you just don't know yeah. what their political allegiances are and that what you're doing is not in the service of those allegiances. So what I say is do some reflection. Think of something that you could do where it just, the activity is honestly taken by you, believed to be by you, not in the service of or expressive of your political allegiances, and go try it and see what happens. And if your political identity starts getting affirmed in the course of that, do something else. If the alien political identity gets affirmed in the course of that, try to tell the people that you're not there for politics and see if that works. And if that doesn't work, try something else. Yeah. I think that um, the institutions and any sort of larger um, kind of intervention from that sort of very personal and local that I just described, uh, I think at this point is likely to be captured, have already been captured by a certain kind of political valence, a certain kind of self-selected group that's going to participate in it, that's going to be understood by the participants yeah. as part of the furthering of their political project. I guess so I meant things that are sort of sort already in the air, so, you know, things like, Radically shortening the campaign seasons for elections. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, getting yeah. rid of primaries, which tend to sort of, um, you know, you have to do this horrible pivot. You know, the primary, you have to go way to your base, purify. And then in the general, you have to swing back. And now all of a sudden you're a moderate. That's what I sort of meant. And these sort of things have been propo are proposals that have been in the air for quite some time. And I don't yeah. know that they obviously point in one political direction or another. Do you have any hope for things like in structural things like that? Or I mean, I think that a lot of the kinds of uh, proposals that you're mentioning are good ideas. I don't have any hope that they are likely to be taken up okay. because the, um, again, they would the require way, the sort of cooperation that we don't yet have. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And the way the, the way rank and file citizens in this country are mobilized according to their partisan identities, polarized along those lines, again, is just a strategic gift to the parties. They yeah. they benefit from the democratic citizenry being the way that it is because it makes all of their strategic choices about how to market and polish and campaign and manage and contour candidates and policies and campaigns Really, really simple. So yeah. they're benefiting uh, uh, from the whole thing, and so it, it's not going to it's not going to change unless we start demanding something different. Yeah, which means it's not going to change until we be become bottom. less vulnerable yeah. to to the way things are. And um, I, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. So there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there yeah. you go. <laughs> All right, Robert Talese. Thank you, Dan. Because over during democracy, everyone should buy this. It's really excellent, and. Um, and uh, um, I want to thank you very much. And I know the book is successful. I hope it continues to be. And um, um, I look forward to your next effort. You said your next, are you already, on, are you already working on the next one? I'm beginning to work on it. Um, and the working title is uh, Sustaining Democracy, Citizenship for Enemies. Mm, mm, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Um, and um, I look forward to uh, speaking with you again sometime. Thanks for your time. It was really great to talk to you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.